Muppet. Fog is a Muppet. Um, all, all, all of my, our, our house has a naming scheme of Muppets, and um, we, we, we've used all of the Muppets that are most familiar to people. So we're on to the Muppets that are unfamiliar to people. Um, and, and Fog is, uh, yeah, my, 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 the, the machine I do most of my testing on is called Harry, because Har Crazy Harry breaks things a lot. So. Anyway. Um, hi everyone, and uh, welcome back to the uh, the <coughs> unconference part of the uh, the, the, the Colonel Miniconf. Um, I'm I'm flattered that you want to, me to talk, and I'm going to talk until you start booing. So the louder the booing gets, um, the more likely it is I'll, I'll hand the microphone over to whoever wants to speak next. Um, vote on the spreadsheet for the people that you want to hear speak next. Um, so. I, I got voluntold to talk about persistent memory. Um, so I'm, I'm giving a talk focused on the user side of persistent memory on Thursday. Um, so this is the kernel mini conf, and I'm not going to be covering anything that I'm talking about now um, on, on Thursday. Um, so from, from the kernel's point of view, um, Oh, okay, I should probably do the, the introduction. What is persistent memory? And it's, it's memory that persists when you turn the power off. Um, we're all familiar with DRAM. This is, this is, this is stuff that works at roughly DRAM speeds, um, is roughly <coughs> has roughly equivalent bandwidth to DRAM, um, generally sits in a, a, a dim socket. Um, can you buy it? Yes, yet, yet yes. Yes, you can buy persistent memory. Um, it's very expensive at the moment. Um, it has various different trade-offs depending on exactly whose DIMMs you buy, and they may or may not be readily available. Um, What's the density? Well, it depends who you're buying it from. So, is it similar <laughs> to DRAM or higher power? Um, so the question is, is, is the density similar to, higher or lower than DRAM? And uh, my answer is, well, it depends. Um, because you, 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 you can buy um, you, you, you can buy DIMMs that are uh, let's say um, 60, uh, well, yeah, um, sort of in the 8 gigabyte kind of range um, that have 8 gigabytes of DRAM and 8 gigabytes of NAND on, on a power fail event, they just copy the DRAM to NAND. So they are exactly equivalent <laughs> to DRAM, um, but very, very expensive because um, they've got a nice big capacitor on them to keep the power up until they've got every last byte out of the, out of the DRAM onto NAND. Um, there's all kinds of exciting new technology that um, some of you may have seen the um, the announcement um, in the, within the last year of uh, 3D Crosspoint from my employer Intel. Um, that I I can give you absolutely no information on 3D Crosspoint whatsoever that isn't already public. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to come here and do some kind of big splashy announcement, and I know various characteristics about what this technology can do, but I'm not allowed to talk about any of that. Um, so, uh, bizarrely, the, 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 the biggest thing the press seems to be concerned about is what kind of material is it made out of. Um, I, I, I don't really understand the <laughs> their, their motivation. I mean, their motivation. Um, it, it, it's made out of recycled newspapers. That, that's that, that's the secret. What's, what's the density of the recycled of, 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 of the recycled newspaper? Um, 3, 3D. I, I don't think we've released any kind of information on that. I'm going to have to report that IP violation. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, you, you, if, if, if I'm already being violated, reported for IP violations, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from, from, from the kernel's point of view, um, we, 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 we get told about the persistent memory through ACPI, um, at least on Intel platforms. Uh, some, some of our competitors will have other interesting ways of being informed from their own firmware about uh, ranges of memory that are, are persistent. So this stuff shows up in the address map, um, just like any other uh, DIM would, because it comes in a DIM form factor. Um, and so, okay, now, now, now we know that this particular range of memory is persistent, what do we do with it? And our answer for the moment is to have a uh, device driver, a, um, a block device driver. Um, 
which you can find in the Linux kernel source tree in uh, drivers slash uh, nvmem slash uh, pmem.c. Um, and that will just attach itself to any ranges of memory that are, that are marked as, as being persistent because the first thing you want to do with some persistent memory is use it as a block device. Um, and that's great. That works. That There are no problems I'm aware of with that. It, um, it, it is a very, very fast block device that works with, you know, it, it does mem copies internally. So that's fun. And um, for a lot of people, that really is all they want from it. And uh, there's very boring. Does it work? To use the, the PMEM driver, do you need anything other than to be able to load and store from, from a CPU point of view, yeah. you mean? Yeah, so, so I use normal RAM and pretend it's persistent memory all the time. That's how I do all of my testing. Um, I don't have one of these magical DIMMs in my house. Um, and I can't tell you what we have in our lab. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have DIMMs from other vendors in our labs, I can tell you that much. Uh, we have gone out and bought um, one of these DIMMs that does parafail snapshots to, uh, to, to, to um, NAND, and uh, that, that works just fine with this framework, which is good. Um, but I'm, I'm not really, it, it's, it's not really an interesting thing, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a very, very simple driver, um, and I, don't, I, I didn't really do, do any of the work on it. <laughs> Um, my, my area of expertise is in um, what we call DAX, the uh, direct access part. And what, what this does is it lets you say, okay, we have this persistent memory block device. We have a file system on it, um, but what we'd really like to do is not do any caching of the writes that we're going to do to the block device because this stuff is similar in performance to DRAM. There is no point in having a RAM, a DRAM cache in front of something that is similar to DRAM in performance. So um, this has been a really interesting exploration for me in terms of uh, how, how do we get, how, how do we um, bypass such an integral chunk of the Linux file system code. Um, the, the, the page cache is um, really fundamental to how Linux file systems work, and bypassing it is um, tricky, shall we say. So, um, the, 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 the trickiness may be um, determined by the fact that I, I've been speaking about this stuff at LCA since um, Perth, and um, I just did a huge rewrite of the code on the plane right here. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So we, we, we started with this um, code originally from IBM, from the S390 side of the house, um, called FileMap XIP. Um, there were already three different things in Linux called XIP, so, um, and people get kind of confused whenever I talk to them about it, so I renamed the, uh, the, the, the code from XIP to DAX. Um, the, the motivation on the S390 side of the house was to run um, tens of thousands of virtual machines um, on a single instance, um, because what, what, what they were doing was um, each of these virtual machines had essentially the same user space. And so they didn't want each um, instance of the virtual machine to be caching the underlying thing in its, in its own, the, the, the underlying file in its own, um, uh, own DRAM. They wanted just to be able to uh, share um, the, the, the pages between all of the instances. So uh, libc, for example. Um, or, or, or the shell. They, they want to be able to share all of that between different instances. And I'm happy to report that DAX didn't break that. DAX still uses, uh, is, is still able to support that. Um, one, one of my uh, colleagues uh, works on uh, Clear Linux, and uh, they, their, their goal is to 
again, boot tens of thousands, or actually not tens, it's not the number, it's how quickly he can boot um, a, a, a virtual machine, um, sub-second. Um, uh, clear Linux? It's, it's, it's a distribute, well, distribution, it, it's a, um, it, yeah, that's called a distribution of Linux that, that Intel's put together. Um, it's um, a, a, a one of these technology demonstration kind of uh, distributions that um, the, the idea is to showcase technologies that uh, we think people would like to use and the, uh, the mainline Linux distributions aren't putting together into, um, in, into their distributions as, as quickly as we might like. So um, it's, I, I don't think it's something that we're encouraging people to run, um, but it's, it's something that um, is, is there to demonstrate that it can be done. Um, so the, 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 the idea here is to, the, the idea for, that, for, for, for this particular piece of it is to demonstrate that you can, um, you can spin up a full KVM virtual machine um, in, about a, in, in about the same amount of time as, it ta as, as you can start a new container instance. Um, and containers don't give you quite as much isolation as a KVM does, so we're, we're, we're showing um, more security um, in, a, um, in, in a comparable amount of, with a comparable amount of overhead. Um, I, I'm, I'm not terribly, um, I'm not following what, what they're doing terribly closely, uh, but I, I was involved from the point of view of, hey, did you know this feature exists? Can you check I didn't break it? Oh, hey, we didn't know that feature existed. Let's try it. Oh, wow, that, that reduces our memory usage per virtual machine by a huge amount. I mean, we, we went from occupying, um, I think, tens of megabytes down to sub-megabyte amounts of memory. J just, just booting, right? I mean, just, just, just getting to a shell prompt, right? Because you, you, you don't have to page in all of libc. You don't have to page, you know, it's, it's all just there. So that's cool. Um, I, I, I really like that feature, um, although I don't use it myself. Um, so, let's see. Well, what do you guys want to know about um, persistent memory? Yes? I, I'm maybe a really stupid question, but in your approach of, of trying to bypass the page cache rather than just using the page cache like around the around it, why have you taken that first? Okay, so what, what, why bypass the page cache instead of using the page cache, like GrammarFS does? Um, yeah, so we could. Um, we, we, we could um, have struct pages which pointed to the, um, the persistent memory, and whenever you attempted to access it, uh, you, you would go through that. So the problem is that struct page is um, not an... It, it, it's, it's a fairly considerable amount of, it's, it's a fairly considerable size data structure. It's um, a, approximately 64 bytes for each 4K page, um, which is about 1.5%. Uh, depending on your page size, but you know, I, I work for Intel, so pages are 4K. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, the um, so, but what we um, what we believe to be the case, and if you look at our announcement of three, we, we aren't announcing speeds and feeds of uh, any products. But if you look at the announcement for three G cross points, they, they said we're going to use it in SSDs. And so, if you believe that you might get something comparable to um, an SSD capacity in a single DIM and you look at the number of DIM slots there are in a system, you start to think, well, hey, that's, that's going to be an awful lot of storage that you want to put a, the, 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 the you want to start to create struct pages for. And traditionally... It's purely about the on-disk size of the, the, the on-disk Yeah, on, 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 on media. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we, we, we haven't, 
we haven't traditionally required people to scale the amount of memory they have in the system with the amount of storage they have in the system. I mean, you do start to run into problems with not being able to fusk um, petabytes of storage if you've only got megabytes of memory. Um, but, you know, the, the, that's, that's a fairly loose amount of scaling. It's not, um, it's, it's, it's not the, the type, well, 1.5% of your memory is going to go away. Um, sorry. 1.5% of your storage um, Yeah, we, we haven't typically said 1.5% you know, of the amount of storage is going to be subtracted from your memory. Um, and, and we felt that customers might not like that. You know, it's, it's, it's fine when you're talking about, oh, I've got 8 gigabytes of storage and eight gigabytes of, 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 re of ordinary RAM, but when you've got you know, hundreds, of mega hundreds of gigabytes of storage or more, you start to think, yeah, that, 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 that's, they're, they're pro people probably aren't going to appreciate that amount of storage being taken away. So we're trying to do without struck page. Um, <coughs> now, we were trying to do without the page cache at all. Um, so the, there's, there's a Radix tree embedded in the... Um, embedded in, in the inode um, and we had been avoiding putting entries into it. We did have to put some entries into it in order to cover zero um, holes in the file but um, the rewrite that I was doing on the plane and haven't quite finished yet is um, trying to actually use the radix tree in order to store um, physical addresses rather than use the radix tree to store struct pages. And uh, so that, 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 that's, a, that's a fairly major rewrite. It's about a quarter of the file, so <laughs> a quarter of the tax code so far. Um, and I, by the time I finish it, it's probably going to be about 90% of the code is going to change. But um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see. Uh, Peter, I think you had a question first. There's going to become a day when you haven't got any DRAM in your machine. What, what, what an interesting suggestion, sir. Yeah, so what do you do then? You first treat the whole thing as storage. You can have a partition, I suppose, and treat half of the storage and half of the storage. Why? I haven't thought about this problem at all in the past. Um, why, why, why don't I speculate on the fly about what I might do in such a situation? <laughs> Um, I, I, I might, for example, choose to treat some of the persistent memory as being um, as, as, as being non-persistent, right? I mean, you, you, you can do that. If, if it is better than DRAM in every single aspect, then why wouldn't you do that? Um, the, the, the other thing is that once, once we do get to this amazing imaginary future, um, it, it, it might be the case that we completely change our... Um, operating system um, abstractions, and and we we just we, we get to a more Android model where you know nothing ever you, you, you there's no such thing as non-persistence, right? That um, you turn your computer off, you turn it on again, it comes back to the state that it had, um, which means you can never fix it by turning it on and off again. Yeah. So 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 so. Right, I mean, it, it, but you know the, the, that that that's a major overhaul, and it's not clear that we're going to get there in any um, reasonably close kind of time. Um, so, DAX is one approach. It's not the only approach. It's not necessarily the best approach, but it's where we're heading today. Yeah, so the question is, should, should we have a new file system instead of retrofitting old file systems to use DAX? Um, I absolutely encourage anyone who wants to work on a new file system to do so. Um, it is uh, very expensive to write. It is fun to write a new file system. I have written dozens of new file systems. They're all awesome. And I don't want anybody else to trust any of their data to my exciting file systems. Um, <laughs> 
Well, you know, other people might think my file systems are awful, but I thought they were exciting and fun to write and, and, and awesome to use. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, 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 it is such a major undertaking. So. Um, Intel Labs produced a new file system called PMFS. Um, it was released on an unsuspecting public. Um, I, I don't recommend that anybody um, look at it. Uh, for, I, I, I know we have um, people here who, who like RCU, so I'll just say um, it took RCU locks uh, and then scheduled. Um, it also had a, there, there was one, yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't SRCU. Yeah, no, no. Um, also, it had one call to um, synchronize RCU, and it was commented out because it was slow. <laughs> oh, they're, they're 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 so smart in the labs, and yet they they they're, they're, they're not they're not Linux people, right? They they don't understand. <laughs> um, uh, ben was next, and then I see Stephen. Yeah. In what circumstances do I use the page cache today with DAX? Um, you mean in the code that is currently in 4.4? Yes. Um, I, the page cache is used for the case where you have a, um, a file on a file system with a hole in it, and you page fault on the hole. So if you think of a very sparse matrix, if, you, if you've got some horrible old Fortran code that decides to represent its, its matrix as, on a, as a file, and it's incredibly sparse, um, then you know, you, you, when, when, when you read from it, because you're scanning across it to do a giant matrix multiply or something, you don't want to allocate a page on storage. So we allocate a temporary page in DRAM, put a pointer to that page in, in the processes page table, and put that page into the radix tree. And then under memory pressure, we'll just allow that page to fall out of the radix tree. All right, and but on the right, you eventually hit the, uh, so not want it in the page cache. On, on, on a right, we will evict that page from the page cache. We will scan every process that has it. We'll scan through all the processes that have that file mapped, evict that page, uh, delete it from the page cache, and replace it with, uh, we, we won't actually replace it in anybody's page tables. We will wait for those processes to refault on that page, and then we'll put that the, um, the, the physical address into their page tables. I have another question. Uh, last I looked at PMEM, and that's what I looked at, uh, there was no formation for anything like MC to actually commit to personal storage. So basically, if you're MMAP in your space, you are responsible for using what they want to do. Uh, ben, ben, ben is revealing that he hasn't looked at the latest version of the Linux kernel. Um, we, we, <laughs> we, 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 we put, put uh, F-Sync support into, um, into DAX. Um, in, in, in F-Sync and M-Sync, yes, bo both are supported. Bo both were, inten or, or were always intended to be supported. It was just a question of when was the code going to get written, and it wasn't as uh, quickly as we would have liked to. Uh, it, I, I believe it's in 4.4. <laughs> and I'm rewriting all of that code right now anyway, so you don't have to look at it because it's, it's all getting replaced. At least uh, that's, that's, that's my ambition. Finally, Stephen, I'm getting back to you. Uh, my, my, my colleague Stephen is making the excellent point that um, if, if, if you have persistent DIMMs, you, you really do want to be encrypting the data that's on them to protect against opponents with a scanning, tunneling electron microscope. And um, all I can say is that um, Intel has a security team who consider these questions very deeply when making um, product decisions. So you, 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 you were thinking that a hardware company would be relying on software to do encryption rather than doing encryption down in the hardware. Or something would not trust 
Okay, I, I don't pay too much attention to that, if I'm honest. I, we, like I said, we have a, we have a really good... It seems making the point this applies to enterprise hardware, not uh, consumer level gear. And uh, all I can say is, well, there's a, re there's a reason you pay a premium for uh, <laughs> enterprise quality. And, and um, yeah. And the second one is, um, you probably are the person, but I've had a few issues with my nice NVMe drive works great for normal file system storage. Yeah, we're talking about persistent memory, not NVMe. <laughs> it doesn't, but the point is that there are many co-pass in the kernel that. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of co-paths in the kernel, and you do need to exercise all of them, and, and maybe uh, testing hasn't uh, always been all it could be. Yeah, you, you, you definitely get uh, better quality testing done by uh, millions of people having your product than you do by a product quality assurance team. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> yes, sir. So the, the persistent memory I'm talking about is not attached via the PCIe bus. It, it's, it's, it's attached on DIMMs. Um, there are people who make products that are um, uh, PCIe attached memory. Um, the problem with those devices is that the, 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 the PCIe bus, at least on Intel platforms, um, is outside of the CPU's coherency domain. So, what that, and what that means um, uh, that's relevant to an application program, this can be seen in user space, is let's say you have two processes on different CPUs that M map the same memory. Um, you can do write A followed by write B on, uh, in, in one process and C write B without seeing write A in the other process. Even if that's to the same cache line, which just blows my mind, and I'm, I'm sure... So I'm assuming cacheable memory. Well, yeah, I'm assuming cacheable memory. Why, 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 I mean, particularly if you're going across the PCIe bus. On we can only map PCIe non well, I suppose that's one way of dealing with a coherency problem is not to support caching it, yes. <laughs> right, ordering is also, is, on Intel, ordering is part of the coherency protocol, yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you're using some broken ass arm instead of, you know, a, a, a nice uh, server class CPU. Oh, sorry, sorry, was that, 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 that out loud? Uh, sorry. <coughs> A question in the back there. Yeah, um, I'm thinking about whether this could be used for hibernation. So I'm wondering about issues like, um, I assume because it's RAM like you don't have to worry about where the system is. Uh, so the, the question was uh, um, whether, whether this can be used for hibernation. And it was kind of a, a follow on question about uh, whether, whether you have to wear, worry about wear leveling. Um, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. So we do not worry in DAX about wear leveling. Um, the uh, DAX is technology neutral. So we assume that um, if you have um, technology in your system that does require wear leveling, that your application knows to avoid doing the things that would um, require wear leveling. Um, you know, the, the, there's various people with specialized applications who, who say, oh, we, we, we don't need wear leveling because our application, for example, is a uh, circular log. Um, so, so it is already distributing the, the, the wear absolutely evenly, and there is absolutely no reason for us to do anything, um, and, and we just want to um, avoid having any kind of wear leveling at all. So that, that's, that, that, that's one answer. And the other is that if 
somebody has um, technology that does require, require wear leveling, they might choose to do it at some other layer. Um, they, they, they might choose to do it in the hardware, they might choose to do it um, with some uh, special software. Um, it, but DAX assumes that there is no wear leveling problem, or that the wear leveling problem is solved elsewhere. Um, funnily enough, DRAM actually has wear leveling problems. Um, you, 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 you sometimes see some interesting things about DRAM's performance characteristics seeping through into user visible stuff like Rowhammer. Um, it, 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 DRAM's wear leveling is, uh, is, 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 you know, it's orders of magnitude different from NAND, right? It's, um, NAND, modern NAND is something like 1,000 to 10,000 writes to a, a particular sector, and uh, to a particular bit, and, it, and that bit is presumed wiped out. Um, when you look at DRAM, it's something in the order of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15 writes to a single bit, and, and you can presume it will be wiped out. So, you know, it's all, so many orders of magnitude that nobody notices under normal load. But I, I remember when I was at HP, we, we, would, we had a machine that we were loading hard doing TPC performance runs, and it just, like, after like a year, we had worn out those dims. I mean, yeah, we'd worn out the hard drives as well, but the dims were actually failing because we had been using them so hard. It is possible to do, <laughs> but it's so hard that people don't, don't know about it. Now, where the various different technologies that people are working on are going to fall on that continuum between look at it and it's dead, and, and it'll last a year, you know, that, that's, that, that's something that, that, that the laws of physics and how good people's manufacturing will determine. And... Um, you know, the, eventually the marketplace will decide which um, which ones have the right characteristics to be worth buying. And if people aren't buying it, then people won't make it anymore. So we'll we'll, we'll see what happens on the wear leveling front, um, and other other kinds of things. I mean, if you look at if you look at the other things that NAND suffers from, like read disturb, write disturb, um, just all kinds of uh, all, all all kinds of stuff goes on, and. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, can you use it for hibernation? Absolutely, you can use it for hibernation. Um, it, it, it presents as a block device, so you, know, you, you can put a swap device on it and you can hibernate to that swap device. You know, um, it's a block device, you can partition it. You, there's any, anything you, you're used to being able to do with a block device, you can do with this. Any more questions? From the giggles, I think everybody heard that in the room, but um, <clears throat> for, for, for the benefit of the recording, um, uh, do, do, do I think we're going to get to a point where everyone has persistent memory and people just forget to do things like call msync and then we're going to see bugs when people go back to actually using spinning rust and, and you, need to call M you need to remember to call fsync all of a sudden and there's the sideline snark comment of because of course people get fsync so correct so frequently today. And all I can say is you're, you're absolutely right, Stuart. <laughs> I mean, pe pe programmers suck at syncing, at, at, at synchronization of all, all kinds. Um, and, and, and um, you know, I, 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 F-Sync is especially bad, yeah, because it's, it's such a performance hog when you get it right, and even worse when you get it wrong. And so people often just don't, don't bother with it. And what was it, uh, lib eat my data we have that turns F-Syncs into not, yeah, yeah I, th I, thought, I thought you wrote that. You, I remember you telling me about it, I just didn't remember whether or not you wrote it. Yeah, so, so what, what I was going to go on to say was that um, 
we have a library, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about this on Thursday, uh, called LibNVML, um, the Non-Volatile Memory Library. Um, and hopefully that's going to... Pe pe people are going to be using that instead of um, raw calls to F-Sync, M-Sync, or raw CPU instructions, or... It, it, it provides... Um, it provides... And by the way, it works on both... Um, it, uh, on, on, on both uh, files backed by solid-state storage as, as well as files on uh, NVM. And I guess it will probably also work very well on, on files across the network or files on spinning Rust. But, um, yeah, it, it, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically... It's mostly a higher-level programming library. I mean, it's a set of libraries, so you, you can do with it what you want. But it, it's providing um, primitives that we think are, uh, are useful for people to build uh, databases on top of, for people to... Uh, we, we actually have a, a demo in the, uh, <laughs> in the library of a uh, Space Invaders game. Um, you, 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 you'll get to see it on Thursday. I'll play it for you, I promise, on, on the big screen. Um, and uh, yeah, so so we're, we're we're trying to move programmers away from calling f sync m sync directly and towards using higher level abstractions. Like, I would like to allocate a block of persistent memory. Please give me a pointer to it. And and so rather than having everyone go off and write their own allocator for persistent for blocks of persistent memory, we're providing one. We've tested it. It works. We think. Um, we, we've actually put a lot of effort into um, simulating crashes between each instruction and, you know, it, 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 is it possible for it to get corrupted? And, and you know, we're, 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 we're hoping not. And, and building all kinds of other kind of fun abstractions on top of it. It's not, there's, there's not just a block allocator. There's, there's all kinds of other fun things that we've done. Um, I'm sure people still find ways to put bugs in their programs that are hard to uncover, but we're, we're trying to move people a little bit higher up the stack. And, you know, may, maybe everyone's going to write managed code one day, and, and, and you know, it'll be all Python and, and, and Ruby, and yay, yay for not C. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But we're, we're trying, we're trying, we're, we're very much aware of the problem, and we're, we're, we're trying to avoid people, we're trying to avoid encouraging people to make those mistakes. Better again. Slightly, maybe there is an I was missing all the little bit straight to the new kernel and new stuff on some experiment. I noticed there is two basic fundamental ways to access memory in the ACPI slash and so forth. One being PMEM, which we're familiar with, which is the basic of all the memory maps. The other one being PLK, whatever that is. Is that something that has a Okay, so the, the, the question is that um, Ben has, has, has noticed that there are two different, two entirely different ways of using the uh, persistent memory. Uh, what, one is that the DIM may be presented um, in, in persistent memory mode, which is what I've just been talking about, and the other is that it may be presented as some, as some kind of BLK thing, and what the hell is that? Um, also, is there a future to it? Uh, yes, there is a future. So, <clears throat> um, we believe, that given the amount of, uh, g given what's currently being discussed and the size uh, in, in terms of um, densities, uh, bit density and, and sizes of um, DIMMs, not just from us, but from our competitors. Um, I, I'm sure you can name a few potential competitors who might have some very high density, uh, who've been talking about their very high density um, uh, uh, persistent memory. Um, that we will see systems which can have, and, and the, num the number of DIM slots in a system, um, that we will see systems that you can put more persistent memory in than will fit in the current Intel Z on address space. So that is why the block mode exists. Uh, it, essentially, it's, it's, it's a bunch of different windows, and you can, ad you, can put the, you can address different chunks of the DIM with, with each window independently. Um, so this gives uh, customers a way to use that, but not as persistent memory as uh, just in block mode. 
And yeah, this, this isn't ideal, but it's going to take some time to increase the number of physical bits that the CPU supports. Um, the, the Intel CPU has 46 bits, I believe, uh, which is 64 gigabytes. Uh, terabytes, sorry, yes, yes. Four is tera, yes. 64, 64 terabytes. So yeah, the... the the uh, Intel doesn't require half of that to be taken away for PCIe. Uh, we, 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 we allocate more, more in smaller granules than that. Um, but I mean, so, some, some amount of that address space one presumably does not want to use. So yeah, you, you, you can't put 64 terabytes of persistent memory into an Intel system and expect to use it all in, in, um, as, as directly addressable. The, the CPU doesn't support that. And the CPU people are, are well, that's internal. I, I shouldn't talk about that. Have, have I thought about supporting these temporary, hopefully temporary horrors in DAX? And I, I, I suppose I did give it a few seconds of thought before, before running away. Well, I mean... That was my only question. Are they here to stay? Well, are they here to stay? I mean, you know, is... is uh, before, before, before the... Uh, um, before the sun goes supernova, I'm, I'm expecting them to, to go away. Um, you know, I mean, what, 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 what's, what's your time frame on expected to stay? Um, I don't, I, I, I think it would compromise DAX too much to support those, ki DIMS supporting those ways. I mean, if, if, if we get sufficient demand, I suppose we could do it. There, there, there certainly are DIMS from other vendors um, yeah, again, I probably shouldn't talk about uh, company names, but uh, there, there, are, there are DIMMs in the marketplace today um, that use a similar kind of sliding window technique. And so if, if one were uh, sufficiently interested in those kinds of, of DIMMs, one could, um, one could look at that. It, it, there's, there's, kind, there's kind of a quality of implementation issue here, right? So if, if you're talking about having thousands of these windows, each, you know, um, Let's let's eat a few megabytes and stuff. Well, okay, so 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 yeah, there, there's a performance problem if you're looking at it from the point of view of um, wanting to do DAX to it. There's no performance problem if you're looking from the point of view of just wanting to use it as a block device. Um, so yeah, I I think uh, the support for those kinds of DIMs it it could be really interesting, but it could be really really hard, and I'm not sure there's sufficient advantage to, to doing that. So I haven't talked about that. Yes, sir. Are, are we going back to the world of having high mem? No, no, we are not. Um, so, so, so this is it's storage. It's storage that the, 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 the block mode DIMMs that Ben was talking about here are storage. They're nothing more than storage. They're not, they're not, they happen to be on the memory bus. They happen to be addressable. Uh, the, 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 AP, the API for access them happens to be mem copy after you do some magic. Um, but no, this, this, this is not high mem in any kind of, of way that people talk about high mem. This, this is um, just a different way of accessing a block device. Um, that happens to look an awful lot like memory if you squint at it the right way. Um, a high, you know, in order to support things like high mem, you'd, you'd want to be talking about things like, oh, are we going to, uh, are we, are we going to put a page of code in it and execute that code directly? No, you can't do that. We don't support it. I mean, Ben's kind of asking, can we do that? And I'm, no. No, that, that, that's, it's just not worth doing. I, I, think, I think a lot of le lessons were learned from, from high mem. Um, uh, the x86-64 architecture does not support high mem. I did have discussion briefly with uh, one of uh, my, my colleagues at Intel who's um, 
an x86 maintainer, and he said, well, he, he first he ripped my head off, and, and then he said no. Um, so we're, we're, we're not getting high mem on uh, x86-64, at least not if he's got anything to do with it. And he, he sits on all the right committees within Intel to make sure that uh, we're, 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 not going to, we're not going to expand the number of physical bits of addressing without also expanding the number of virtual bits of addressing. Um, so he wants to, he, he's, he's making sure that um, we, uh, we're, 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 we will never have to support high mem in x86-64. It's just too expensive and painful. We've, we've, we've run out of questions. Thank you all. Um, so despite having slides, we didn't actually prepare this at all. Uh, so <laughs> this was just a bunch of things I threw, threw down, and hopefully we can talk around it. If you've got questions, then please speak up. So just should, should we say first we work on, on Linux on power, and, and we have close to processes, and therefore we might simulate said processes? Yes. yes. <laughs> we have access to a lot of different simulators inside of IBM. We both work for IBM, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, we've got, I guess we'll talk about what different types of simulators we have in a second. And, and I guess interested to hear what other people have used, other, other simulators. Willie, you can tell us all about your stuff, I hope. Um, but anyway, so why, what simulator types, speed and memory, I.O., debug, why do you want to do this? So let's start with the why. Why do you want to use a simulator? Um, well, well, we build processes. So <laughs> apparently they're really expensive to make one. And so doing like repeatedly iterations is a really bad idea unless you have infinite money because apparently chip fabrication plants cost, you know, more than $20. And then like doing a first run of a chip takes more than, you know, 15 minutes. And, and making <laughs> a set of masks might cost you mm, a few million dollars. Yeah, more money than you have in your pocket. So, so firstly, they're easy to get. So I often just use a simulator for my work uh, because I can just spin up a simulator on my laptop or on any machine. They're all, it's always present on my laptop. I don't have to go to everyone else in the lab and see, hey, have you got, you know, is, is power rate number three free? I, I, it's just always there. It's always ready to go. So that's one reason why you want to use a simulator. It's easy to debug. So looking inside a simulator is usually very, very easy to debug. You don't have to, you can stop it at any point, you can have a look at everything that's going on, you can look at all your architect state, your memory, maybe I.O., all those sorts of things. Very, very, very easy to debug. You can do fancy things like simulate a single core processor to attempt to isolate a bug rather than have many, many, many cores doing too many things at once. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can spin up anything you want as well. So if you do want lots of stuff, then you can. If you don't, then yeah, you can do that. You can simulate hardware that doesn't exist yet. So this is kind of what I guess Stuart was alluding to at the start. We can, you know, we've got Power 8 in the field now. We're, you know, looking at Power 9. We, you know, how do we, how do we uh, simulate that? How do we start running our code? So we can look at, we can simulate stuff that we don't actually have physical access to. Um, you might also have, and it goes back to the first point of, as well, is you may not have access to this machine right now. Or say someone here doesn't have access to a Power 8, they can go and download a, a Power 8 simulator or if they don't have access to an ARM or whatever. Everyone has access to ARM. Um, but whatever, you can get access to any machine you want, um, but then you can also write a simulator that simulates something that novel that you're interested in. Uh, this is another big reason for us. So we work in the LTC. Uh, the Linux Technology Center inside IBM. We get new hardware. We want to write code for the kernel for that. So we need to be able to support Power 9. So we do our code bring up in simulators before we actually get the hardware. When you actually get this hardware in the lab, we get very early revisions of it. You get, you get a, the ability to um, get new chips in the lab, and then you get the ability to, to make some changes to that, but you have to be able to find bugs in that period of between when you get your first revisions and when you get revisions that you're actually going to send out to customers. Those, those windows are very small because if you don't get it, if, if you can't find bugs in that region, then in that time period, then you're not going to make it to market on time. So 
you want to be ready for, for your bring up phase. So this enables us, simulators will enable us to get all that code sorted well before we hit the lab. And so we're ready to go day one. And that critical period when we've got that new hardware, we can, we can run straight away. We can also do things like feedback as like, is this hardware feature going to be useful? Well, we can run it in sim. Then you can try and write other code for it and then go, well, is this going to be useful at all? <laughs> so uh, any, other, any, other, any other reasons why people want to use Simo? Sorry, yes, question. Well, both. We're talking, about both. We're talking about both. So, any other reasons why people wouldn't? Anyone else have a reason why they want to use a simulator? What? My test machine doesn't have a serial port. My test machine doesn't have a serial port. Okay, that's reasonable. Um, and you want to get a console out or something like that. Okay. So, do you do you tend to use a console like a, a, a serial port in the simulator, or do you use some sort of in-memory console or or any of the above? <laughs> some unnamed architecture that some company with a couple of letters may yeah. so have another question at the back oh. okay so uh, okay protecting your file system okay cool yeah. So simulator types, these are the few types that we have or the, that I've had experience with. So there's a functional simulator. This is like, um, like QEMU. So it's a, it's a representation of what uh, you think the hardware is. So someone sat there writing C and said, you know, this instruction translates into this and this I.O. translates into this. And they've read the spec, they've run on the machine and they, they basically write a representation of, is of it. Pretty much what people refer to as emulators, right? You're sort it's of emulating the function of the machine, not, you know, the exact hardware characteristics. And these are usually pretty quick, like when you can boot a machine in, or can boot x86 in you know, a few seconds, PowerPC is the same, um, without much memory or I.O., they, they, they come up pretty quickly. Uh, so second type is a full hardware description level um, a simulator, so this might actually be simulating the real Verilog or VHDL. Uh, so, uh, you know, you get your hardware guys, they're actually writing VHDL and then they compile it up and you actually try and run on that. So you can see here, this is a, a giant Cadence machine. Uh, Cadence have these, these fast hardware simulators you can buy. Um, and these will... Yeah. <laughs> well, your large multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation can buy. <laughs> yes. Um, so this one's hooked up to some other machine there. Uh, but you can buy these and these will accelerate your, uh, you know, your Verilog or whatever uh, to run at reasonable speeds. Still many orders of magnitude slower than real hardware. Yep, and, yeah, and, and orders of magnitude slower than a functional simulator as well. Uh, and then this is a slightly different one, so a performance functionality. So you might have a simulator that doesn't actually run any code, but you can take, you can give it a trace of code and we might give you some performance metrics out of out of that uh, out of that code. So you might have something that has a, a Haswell microarchitecture, you know, designed into it, and you can run a trace through that and have some idea of how what it's actually going to what speed it's going to run at. It might be useful if you don't have a Haswell. Um, and we would do something similar at, at IBM. So with simulators, a couple of things to think about here is. Uh, so with the speed and, and memory, and when you're, when you're running on, on simulators, it's, it's important to distinguish um, the, the speed of the CPU and how much memory you have. So the speed is usually, say, one to four orders of magnitude slower. So for a functional simulator, you might be like one order of magnitude slower than running on the real hardware. If you're running on like an HDL simulator, you're probably like three or four order orders of magnitude slower. 
or, or 10 <laughs> orders of magnitude slower. So the, the performance you get out of the CPU will, will go down quite a bit, um, depending on which simulator you have. So that, that's important. Memory is not so much of a problem. You usually have a lot of memory in these simulators. Usually uh, the memory in your laptop or on the server that you're actually running the, the simulator or the emulator on can pretty much back one to one with what memory is in, in the actual sim. So you might only be not even an order of magnitude less. So if you've got, you know, well, my laptop has a eight gig in it and I often run sims with one to two gig. So if, especially if you can sparsely allocate your memory in your simulator and you're not using all of it, your memory can usually be quite big, despite the speed being uh, slow. It can so run a few concurrently too, so like make dash four and you run up several simulators with several gigabytes and it's fine. Yeah, you can use all the threads on your, on your machine to actually uh, make it go faster and you don't have to worry about the memory. So, so that's something we want to optimise. We want to optimise the speed of, of, of how fast we boot. So this is kind of where Stuart and I started looking at things um, specifically in power, but a lot of these things, I guess, are pie uh, across the board. So uh, we started just profiling the boot. So I didn't use, well, what's some of the, this boot chart and there's, there's a couple of other things you can use for um, profiling. I started looking at things just in the simulator. So I'd run the simulator for 10,000 cycles and then just dump the program counter and maybe even a stack trace uh, and then do that for a whole boot. Produces a lot of data, but you can then just with a couple of said scripts or all scripts or whatever and Perl scripts, um, you, can, you can get a reasonable profile of where things are actually running and then start looking at that, see, what, see what's being used. Yeah, I was looking at it from a firmware perspective too, where it's kind of like, let's try and run firmware in fewer cycles so I can run more tests during make check. It's pretty much a, like the fewer cycles there, the more I can run and more hardware variations in, in sim. So uh, this is probably fairly obvious. Avoid big drivers. Uh, there's, a, there's also a bunch of config options you want, we, want, we had a look at. So there's a whole bunch of hash tables that um, the kernel will allocate that you really don't need. Um, well, you may not really care about, so. Especially if you're doing like a bunch of the stuff we were looking at was like, well, if we're gonna run certain things in simulators to experiment with code, you don't necessarily need an entirely functioning system. You just want a whole bunch of niceties instead of just writing raw ASM for something there, once you start to have like an operating system, it becomes a lot more useful to run a test on an experimental processor or something like that. Or, you know, well, we still get to a login prompt and we can still, you know, execute a decent number of instructions. Things are probably okay, right? We haven't completely broken everything. Uh, and especially on a hardware level simulator where you're running at, you know, 100 kilohertz, uh, you do want to take the least amount of time possible to start running interesting code. And you haven't had to reinvent the world by writing yet another memory allocator or yet another custom thing and you can start writing code that's specific to what you're going to ship instead of reinventing the wheel three times during development. Yeah, and, and that's, that's certainly important inside our lab. People like running tests on top of a, an operating system where they, you know, they can just pull their test down off the network or off the disk or whatever and it's just kind of all there. Um, so, but that's more in the lab rather than sim. But sim, sim it applies equally. Yeah. Uh, so run uniprocessor. Don't run lots of processors off. Uh, uni, uh, lots of... Um, uh, hardware threads. Yeah, so no hardware threads. I think I compiled out no block devices because they're like bourgeois luxury. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still. still yes. <laughs> yeah, purely looking from a processor point of view, we could do array with block layer and like you know no multi-user and. Hmm. Okay, so... But that is actually a really good use of simulators that was not our primary focus <laughs> doing a bunch of this stuff, but we... Yeah. Yeah, because at least some of our ones, when you start putting multi-cores in, it gets much slower because it starts to actually have to synchronize things. As well as time slicing the... Yeah. So lying about, time, lying about timers is often a, a really good way. You'll, hopefully you can avoid things like M sleep 10 or whatever inside the kernel, but often they, they just happen to be there in drivers. So if you can lie about how fast your timer is going, actually say it's going a lot faster than it really is, um, you can make those sleeps go a lot faster inside your simulator. Not good if you're trying to do any benchmarking or anything, but your benchmarking may not be useful in this way. You might not be caring about benchmarking. So that's a nice way to get your uh, speed up in, in boot times uh, and, and run times. Another thing, assume memory is zero. This can be a little bit 
<laughs> a little bit fraught. Uh, there's a lot of mem sets in the kernel, uh, especially on boot. Uh, and in firmware as well. Yep. Yeah, so early firmware uh, went, because with ECC memory, it zeroes it all. So a long time a physical machine boot is like erasing ECC memory. And then during firmware, we go and mem set a whole bunch of crap. And then during kernel, we mem set a whole bunch of stuff too. So yeah, if you can assume memory zero, then you don't have to do that. And so it shaves a lot of, uh, lot of cycles. So with this, um, so Stuart and I did a bit of an effort on this. We got our boot down through, um, through Skibo, which is our open source firmware, and the kernel. Uh, we can get to user space in about 50 million instructions, uh, which is pretty quick if you're talking about a three or four gigahertz processor. That's I think fast. we cut, there was, a, there was a huge amount of instructions over. I think we started off at like some billion number of instructions through something and then you suddenly cut out like all the config options, start assuming memory zero, uh, load the kernel and firmware into the exact memory locations where they want to be instead of them self relocating, usually with a really crappy mem copy loop that's, you know, five lines of ASM rather than optimized as well. And that managed to cut down a huge amount. So another thing, this was uh, something really pointed out, checkpointing, you can use, uh, simulators often have a way to checkpoint your architecture state, so your registers, memory, maybe even some of your I.O. You can often boot to a point where um, you can say replace the uh, user space. So you can boot the firmware and kernel up to right where it actually starts accessing or starting user space and then just replace that component underneath it. Uh, or you might have, uh, you might want to boot up to a certain point and, and stop and go home for the day and then start the next day. So you can save all that simulator uh, state out to disk and then just restart it the next day. So a lot of, whether it's a functional simulator or an HDL simulator or whatever, they, supporting checkpointing and then restarting it is, is, is uh, very handy. Uh, another thing for speed, or both to both the kernel and firmware, you can just lie about having I/O. I/O is really slow, you generally, especially on boot, when you're waiting for PCI links to train or um, uh, USB links to train or whatever. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there that takes a long time. So if you lie about having any I/O, just you either lie about the model of the I/O, or you just don't have any I/O and say if you need disk, you use say some sort of PMEM driver or you can use whatever you want. Um, you, you can get disk a different way rather than just trying to emulate something in, in, uh, with PCI. A big early win was uh, stopping doing the uh, sp speed estimates for MD, uh, the different RAID <laughs> algorithms. <laughs> it turns out running in a tight loop of seeing which one's faster takes an awful lot of instructions. Like you can actually see it on, your, on real hardware and even in a simulator it's kind of like a what the hell are you doing here? Suddenly benchmarking your simulator on how fast you can execute each individual possibly really slow way to do RAID calculations. And so it's like, oh, we don't do RAID, so hopefully no one is, ever wants to run that in a simulator. Uh, so anyone else got any ideas of how you could speed the thing up? Marcin? Willie, any other cute ideas? Yeah, I, restart from, restarting from checkpoint. Where are you getting the checkpoint from? Just from the same simulator, or? One thing we've been doing is maybe worth mentioning in the presentation on the slide is checkpoint in the functional simulator and transfer that checkpoint into an emulator. So the emulator runs at 100 from the floor, it's really slow. But you can, it is possible, depending on what you're doing. So a functional simulator that puts you under a current to a point in the floor. We've, we've done some performance testing in the past where you know you have um, spec benchmarks they go through certain phases you find you find the phase that you're interested in um, and then you'll checkpoint at that particular particular point 
uh, and then move that into a simulator you care about and do what Ben's saying, you, you warm up the caches and all that sort of stuff and then you can see what you know your cycles per instruction are at those over the period that you care about and, and it, it basically turns, you know, running a full spec benchmark in an HDL simulator is, is, is impossible. It, it would take years and years and years to actually run the whole thing. So using this sort of checkpointing mechanism you can, you, you can do that too. Well, Quimby, we probably could if we can just if we can just use get the architect to stay. We've got memory. Well, and we, we can. We don't want to have a tool. We no. Need to convert the, the same VM state or something. We can pump yeah. into. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We could save into. Uh, we could restore into Quimby because the restore we've got a bunch of restore code that's just software. It doesn't rec rely on the architect the architecture at all. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I/O. So I/O can be a little bit of a, a vex problem. So I/O. So Quemi is really good at this. So Quemi has really good models for uh, for I/O. Uh, it has you know, PCI host bridges, USB. It has you know, actual devices sitting on the back of that. Um, so that's really Which is handy. Really useful for uh, well firmware and kernel re regression testing as well, because you suddenly just spin up a whole bunch of QME with a whole bunch of devices and check that they're still there. And you're like, well, at least we didn't break the world fundamentally. And so as a little sanity check for something. It's kind of nice, and you can actually start doing you know, some amount of I/O before you try on real hardware that takes much longer to boot, and you require a much larger number of machines. Um, but some of these other simulators don't have these things. So um, something like an HDL simulator—it's a really big simulator, really. If you're already simulating a, a full you know, a full core with all its microarchitecture and everything. It's pretty slow and it takes a lot of resources. If you've got one of these big cadence machines, you might not want to have to have another one of those cadence machines to simulate your, your, host, your host bridge or whatever. So you might just want to do without I.O. Uh, at all, uh, entirely, sorry. So what do you do? So one of the things well, Willie was saying about consoles, you can just have a very simple, uh, a very simple console. So you could just have a little UART there. We often just use an in-memory console, so the kernel or the firmware just dumps its console or its log up out to, out to memory, and it can also poll memory for input characters, and this, you can just stick characters in there and pull characters back out if you want. Because um, the console is kind of your first port of call for debugging problems, so we just do our console in memory and then don't have to worry about I.O. at all. Which is useful when you have a way to fast dump out memory from a simulator. Sometimes, like bit banging over various debug interfaces to an actual chip is actually much slower than just dumping memory from the simulator. And so I do, I've done a, a bunch of that too for checking code coverage of various tests. So you, uh, putting GCOV into firmware, you then dump out memory contents, extract out all the GCOV information, then you get LCOV graphs of going, well, this test doesn't actually test all of the error paths here. Perhaps we might want to test some of them. <laughs> the disk. Uh, so the kernel has a really nice facility we've been using for years and years and years just um, with CPIO. So you can just give it a, uh, uh, a CPIO and it will unpack it into memory and then you can just use that. And you can actually chain them as well. So you can have a, like a base file system and like a base, I don't know, busy box or something and then have a few tests that you can chain afterwards. So you don't have to keep updating your init RAM if you don't have to worry about it being corrupted, let's say. Um, you can just, it's always, uh, it's never written back. Uh, which has its own problems, obviously. Um, so using CPIOs is really handy. In ITRAMFS, you can use PMEM driver. I've been meaning to do that for many years, but I haven't gotten around to it. And remember, we've, these simulators have a lot of memory. So we were talking about before. So you know, having your disk in memory is usually not a problem because we have a lot of memory. Um, so speed is slow, but lots of memory. Ben's about to make a point. I like what something to have said before. Yes. <laughs> I know it's a big novelty for <laughs> it. Yeah. It does actually happen. Yeah, we even test our memory allocator. I think just about every code path there is hit, actually. I spent a bunch of time with it. Yeah, about memory, I think it might be helpful. Suppose we have uh, 8 gigabytes. I want to emulate 1 terabyte. Yeah, it's, uh, one, a machine with 1 terabyte. Yeah, you want yeah. to, well, you can and you can, it depends on the simulator. If you actually want to use that eight, that one terabyte of memory in your one eight gigabyte machine, then you might have some problems. But if you just want to use it sparsely, some simulators will just dynamically allocate the memory as you as you need it. So um, it depends on the simulator. It depends on how you use it, um, unless you've got some other experience. Sorry. 
Yeah. Have you got a solution to this problem, or? <laughs> okay. Well, you can. This. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can potentially use, you know, kernel same page merger if you've got things that can, um, you know, that, that are the same, but, you know, the simulator thinks are different. Um, there's but a few other options you have. Yeah, and the more memory you have, the small sort of in it that goes on to actually deal with the fact you have lots of memory, possibly in different numa nodes and different locations, it still just adds up. Uh, so, I, I, if you want to do network, there's a few different options you can maybe use. Well, like Quemu is very easy again. They've got, you know, they have E1000 drivers in there. So that's, that makes life pretty easy. Uh, if you want to do other, other simulators that don't, um, you can maybe do PPP over some serial that you've hacked up. I haven't done this a huge amount. Some of the simulators we have have sort of their own drivers that are not we, upstream. We do it inside the main. petty boot, boot test for memory. So the actual bootloader, we test net booting by just simulating a whole bunch of network devices with a fake DHCP server and everything at the back and... So when, when like with UFI that was down that doing it and doing it just boots the UFI shell over like an MMI ID device versus a word IO device to have an order of magnitude slower trying to get the other. So using like a virtual device that's designed to be a virtual device got us a lot of the other options that you can use did the did the device actually was it actually backed by anything or? Yeah, I mean, if you're backing your your ID device or your ID device onto a file, yeah. but it's the interface that represents the hottest solution towards that. So just by changing the space, you get you get performance. Hmm. Okay. So. Uh, that's the or anyone else want to any other I.O. that people are interested in that they want to run inside a simulator at all? Some people may be interested in simulating I.O. rather than we're all about CPU cores. <laughs> Yeah, there's talk of that with bridging emulators too, on like you emulate the BMC and the host processor and bridge things together to try and actually emulate that and simulate it in software. Yeah, so Ben's talking about bringing those two simulator types together, say a functional simulator and an HDL simulator, and trying to get the best of best of both worlds if, if possible, or maybe a real machine and a and an HDL simulator or whatever. So that yeah, that can be really can be really useful. I know that like Intel on the uh, 40 gig NIC actually did a simulator for the whole 40 gig NIC firmware and wrote the device driver against that before they actually had hardware. That sounds so like can, something that would be useful. You can simulate I.O. as well as CPUs. Yes. Mm. That picture before of the big cadence box was actually plugged into a PCI slot of a machine. So in that case, we would, well, someone was doing something similar there. <laughs> so debug, uh, just, just to cover a few topics on debug. Um, 
So really good for um, for code bring up. Simulate is really good for code bring up. Uh, it's much easier to see what's going on. Uh, generally, it's it's easier to see what's going on in your low level CPU. You can see where it died. You can see you know if you're you know trying to bring up a new MMU or whatever, you can see that you know you're spinning on a, a page faults, just taking recursive page faults, much much easier than on real hardware uh, because you can see what your program counter is, you can see what the stack is, you can see all your GPRs, so you can kind of get a better idea of what's what's blowing up. And you can do it many months before there's actual hardware. Yes. So uh, faster is better for development. So this is part of what Stuart and I were trying to, to achieve. We were trying to make things go faster so that we can spin things around more regularly. So if we've got our simulated out to 50 million instructions, that means we can boot in a few minutes rather than, you know, if it's billions, we're taking hours and hours. So we can, you know, do, you know, 20 runs in a day rather than one run in a day, which is, which is great. Um, but you want to pick the right simulator for the right job. So we do a lot of our code development on functional simulators because they're fast um, and you don't have to worry too much about doing these nasty optimizations. You want to be able to spin around a lot in, with your code development. That being said, most of our nasty hacks aren't really too nasty anymore. I mean, <laughs> it turns out most of the stuff for reduction of cycles can actually be done with this existing kernel config options. And then like, there, there's only like, you've got what, three kernel patches currently? Oh, actually done. One, none, there's, okay. There's, there's one, but that's going away. Cool, yeah, so we basically got down to running pretty much raw upstream. Um, and maybe you know, one thing of like, don't you know, start assuming this memory zero and it's raw upstream kernel does a bunch of, it's a special dot config and it's like, magically really fast. And for ski boot, so in firmware, um, the really only hack we have currently is we inject uh, instructions at address zero to go crash because you've just dereferenced null and perhaps you didn't want to jump there. It turns out if you load the kernel at address zero and overwrite the first 16 bytes, it works just as well as you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the last remaining hack that we have there to, to, to have that happen. The other hack is to assume that the kernel is not an elf in ELF format and loaded at half a gig, it's yeah. at zero and unpacked as well. Yeah, so we have a slight thing there, but otherwise it's like a couple of tiny lines inside firmware. So we still just bring up the machine, it's like pretty much running upstream everything and that's already there for the extreme low cycle one. And even most of the lower cycle hacks, we put in enough that we can run in a functional simulator, you know, is the exact same binary that we ship on, on hardware. Um, you can run it in a simulator. I actually do that for a bunch of the uh, build process, you build using the you know, release build process for firmware image and then you just boot that inside a sim and it takes a relatively small amount of time, usually a bit longer because you do want things like RAID and stuff and when you ship it and want to boot off RAID, but you know, it, we managed to get all that in a format where, that was acceptable. But anyway, it comes back to, you do want to do your code development in the right sim, so you don't want to be using your low, your, your really slow simulator for for things you need to iterate on fast. And it comes back to what Ben's saying as well with, with, co with co-simulation. If you can try and get the best of both worlds, you know, you don't actually care about simulating the CPU, but you care about, um, you don't care about a high fidelity simulation in the CPU, but you care about some high fidelity IO, some, you know, 100 gig network, um, then make that thing the thing that you actually go slow and the CPU can still go fast. So you can still iterate very quickly. Mm -hmm. So getting, getting debug information. So these are the things that are usually fairly easy. So just getting your architect state, just getting your GPRs, your program counter, getting memory. Those sorts of things are fairly easy. Usually fairly easy. If you're looking at a HDL simulator um, of a massively threaded um, super scalar out of order processor and you're trying to find the GPRs for those, that's really, really quite hard. 160 uh, hardware threads, how many registers per? So actually <laughs> getting something that goes down and finds the GPR that you care about, and it's actually, it's quite hard to find out if you've got a, a large super scalar processor anyway, which, at which point in the pipeline do you care about your GPR value as well? Um, that, that can be quite hard. Hopefully some hardware guys have done that, that problem for you. Often they haven't, so. Um, uh, so that, that can be hard, but usually they're the core things you want to be able to get out of your simulator. You want to make sure you've got those basic things. Um, the things that are usually a lot harder are things like caches, TLBs. TLBs um, memory can be harder sometimes. 
Um, caches and TLBs you might care about if you're doing code bring up. If you're doing, say, a new MMU bring up, um, then if you've you know, got to invalidate something, you might actually want to find out what's in the TLBs um, to, to, to debug why you've got some translation problem going on. So um, that can be... Uh, that can be important to get out, but can often be quite hard to get out of a simulator, especially if it's a functional simulator. It may not even have a TLB, or maybe it does, but it's not not as um, not the fidelity that you need. Uh, same with caches as well. If you're trying to debug some sort of locking problem or memory ordering problem, getting the, what's in the caches can be can be quite useful. And that applies to all the other, other I/O devices too, right? Where it's like if you're simulating a host bridge, then you want all of that Im information out of the host bridge to help debug which sometimes people don't like necessarily documenting how to do that. Um, and I think that's all we had, so thanks. Uh, was, uh, was there uh, any other, uh, did anyone else have any comments or questions or? So um, is the fidelity a question, uh, is a problem? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes and yes and no. In a functional simulator, say something like Quemu, um, the fidelity is not there. We've got some functional simulators inside the organisation, and we work with those guys a lot. They, um, it, it's, it, it can be a problem, but usually we find the problems pretty quickly, um, and it's just you know, about having a right, a good working relationship with those teams. Uh, when you come to things like an HDL simulator, you don't have to worry about the fidelity of that because that's 100% representation of what you're going to get in the final product. So that one's not that one's not a problem at all. And you make choices about what you're simulating and what, right? So you don't do everything in the hardware one. And sometimes we'll do it oh, in QMU because actually what we're trying to test here is fine, and we want to just run 200 of them at once and very quickly <laughs> check that the world's still sane and then run it further down. But yeah, fun functional simulators, we always have that problem. You know, they're, you know, they're just reading the spec, we're reading the spec, we're running on the machine, and everyone misinterprets things or misses implementation-specific details that are not in the architecture or something like that. So it's always a problem. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. I think technically we have like 10 minutes until afternoon tea. Let's have a lightning talk. That sounds an excellent idea. OK, um, sort of uh, getting out of where people are. How many people have heard of memorybarriers.txt? Yeah, OK. How many people have uh, like looked at the file a little bit? How many people have read the whole thing? How many people have written part of it? All right. So I was uh, going to a certain university, visiting a certain university in, uh, across the Atlantic for my normal home. And I have a meeting with a professor. I get in there and there's this stack of paper on the desk. This stack of paper has been dog-eared and it's had writing all over it. All right, so this, is, this paper has been gone through and beaten up. I look a little closer and I realize it's, that it is in fact a printout of memory barriers.txt. It's kind of like, okay, this could be an interesting meeting. <laughs> the professor then showed me a prototype of a tool where you put in memory reference instructions and memory barriers in kind of an intermediate language. I mean, it'd be nice if it was SMP MB or something like that, but no, it's like F of MB and things like that. But nonetheless, there's a mapping from the Linux kernel API to the intermediate language. And if you put in several threads and say, it did this, it did this, it did this, and now this one did this, 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 you can push a button and it'll say, yeah, that condition you wanted, that can't happen. Or that condition you didn't want to happen, <laughs> it can. You better fix your algorithm. Now this was a prototype. There were a number of things that uh, weren't quite right about it, and that is still the case after, a few, after some months. But uh, the thing they wanted to do to make it uh, interesting, I mean, people have already done tools like this for ARM and Power and x86, and also some GPUs. So to make it interesting, they wanted to include RCU in it. In other words, they wanted to be able to have it so you put you know, RC read lock, some memory references, RC read unlock, and have a synchronized RCU over here with stuff on it, and have it tell you whether some condition could happen. Um, so, uh, and have that work. And uh, like a fool, I said, yeah, that, that'd be, that should be easy. Uh, unfortunately, there's a rather large amount of crazy things you can do with RCU. 
uh, that the tool needs to know about in case somebody do does them, uh, although I don't have much idea why you would do them. Uh, for example, you can use synchronized RCU, which is the wait for grace period thing, as a really super heavyweight memory barrier if you want to. I mean, it'd be kind of a stupid thing to do, but you can, all right? So you could do something like, you know, set equals x equals 1, do a synchronized RCU, set y equals 1, and on some other CPU, you could say, okay, read y, and if it came out 1, do a synchronized RCU, and then read x. And if you do that, you'll be guaranteed that if you read one up here, you're going to read one down there. You'll also be guaranteed you'll burn many milliseconds of time as well. And you do that just as easily with a much lighter weight barrier. Uh, but you can also do things like have multiple of those things chained out. And as long as they're all grace periods, you can't make a cycle. In other words, the guy down here, if you have a, 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 write, a, a read, then a write, a read, then a write, so you're kind of chaining, a, chaining multiple variables along. Um, if you had two read side critical sections, you could say, okay, we're going to read x, we're going to write y. So uh, read the value of x, write 1 to y. Read the value of y, write 1 to x. Read side critical section, no ordering. The compiler or the CPU can flip those around, and you can get the loop so that both of them read 1, even though you'd think by looking at the code that you know, one should see 0 and the other 1 at best. Well, uh, we went through a bunch of stuff. It turns out that if you have a chain of those things, some of them having read side critical sections and some having grace periods, that there are some rules about how they work together. Uh, and what you do is you count the number of grace periods and the number of read side critical sections. If the number of grace periods is greater than or equal to the number of read side critical sections, it can't happen. You can't get a funny loop. Otherwise, you can, um, assuming you don't do anything else. Of course, you could do something else. You could have an SMP store release and when he reads that critical sections, and then an SMP load acquire and some other one downstream with who knows what in between them. And the tool has to figure that out, which meant that I had to figure it out. Anyway, uh, we're working on that. Um, we're doing in, sort of in the validation phase. And the way you validate one of these things is you generate a lot of litmus tests. The, the actual little thing you give it is called a litmus test. You have initialization, you have the the code that each little thread is supposed to do, and then you have a condition that is either met or not. It might be never met, it might be sometimes met, it might be always met. Um, and so um, uh, at this point, I've gotten probably three quarters of them done. Um, and that means I've, I've, I handed them a, a tarball of 1137 tests. Uh, currently, with a little modification, their model passes all but 90 of them. Um, and uh, they think they've got some things to work on that. So perhaps this time next year we'll be able to have an actual tool, the demo that actually does the right thing for all the uh, known pieces of it. Um, at this point, it does a fair amount. Um, uh, and of course, the other problem is, is that the Linux kernel memory model is a moving target. Um, and so for a while last year, uh, you marked control dependencies with a special thing. Then Linus decided that was a bad, so we don't anymore. And so we've got, we've got some catch-up to do on that sort of thing as well. The hope is, um, one thing, it would be nice if you're doing something fairly complicated with a really complicated thing where you have memory barriers and you're wondering if this really works, to have something you feed it to to find out, and that's one thing. The other thing we're hoping to be able to do is feed it into some higher-level tools. Uh, the Google guys doing some of their thread checking, their, their sanitizers would like something like that. And uh, there's some guys at the University of Oxford working on the C bounded model checker, which takes C as input and tells you things about, about it, and also to some extent handles concurrency. So if we can get that into there, maybe those tools can also know about this. So anyway, uh, that's the lightning talk. We've made some progress on it. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you never know what's going to happen when you walk into a university, I guess is the <laughs> bottom line, no matter how old you've been and how many times you've been there before. Anyway, if there's questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, uh, you know, I'll probably be talk hopefully be talking about a completed version of this uh, next time around. Thank you.